Even now, I remember sitting on my grandmother's noisy plastic covered sofa, the awkward smell of moth balls heavy in the air, a small brown wooden stand beside me, and a huge wooden table in front of me with a chandelier candy dish. Rock hard wax figures for candy buried inside. There are pictures of the whole family at various stages covering the walls. And the Last Supper, my grandmother's living room centerpiece. She's making her signature breakfast, chunky cheese eggs, buttery toast, and bacon. My mother is sitting at the kitchen table sipping coffee. We're visiting. In between my grandmother's stories, the young and the restless, or as the world turns, the news says something about gay people. My grandmother and mother only agree on a few things. One sentiment in particular. During the first meal of the day, with the Last Supper painting in front of me, I get food for thought that stays with me my whole life. Do anything, be anything, except gay. Whenever this statement was uttered, I always wondered where murder fell on the totem pole of anything. <laughs> was taking a life worse than being gay? Or was living my gay life like murdering my family? <laughs> I never really understood. Over the years at my mother's house, I remember her saying how disgusted women's bodies were with periods and childbirth. She never understood how men could want women, and a woman wanting another woman was especially gross. I came out of the closet to my mother back in 2003 while in college. Since I came out to my mother, she's been stuck in her own closet of denial. I don't even remember what my mother said exactly. I just know we haven't been okay since then. We hold steady in strange magnetic fields. Sometimes we stick together, and other times we push each other away. In high school, I had an unofficial gay mentor. Virginia was my teacher, and a writer whose pen name was Adia Jacobs. Virginia and her wife lived on Cherry Street. She was butch and curly-haired, freckled, religious, and opinionated. Her partner was thick and beautiful and femme. Without knowing it, they both provided me with an example of the life I could live. A quiet glimpse into my queer future and I ate it up. We lost touch, but she supported my small queer voice in high school. She helped me think outside the box of my family and everything that I came from. I was moving to Oakland to pursue my master's degree and my identity. When I was in college, there wasn't much of a warm queer embrace. I had lost friends, students I had mentored, and of course, male counterparts needed to question how I had gotten to be a lesbian. They needed to know if I was raped or what specific life event caused me to be a dangerous lesbian. Dangerous because penis wasn't exactly on my list of must-haves. <laughs> dangerous because there's always a fear when people stray away from the norm. It never crossed their minds. It never quite sunk in for them that for me, being a lesbian is an act of freedom. For my body, the lovemaking, the connection, is my freedom. It's, it's the parents, the coworkers, the assumptions, movies, religion, fighting the whole goddamn system that makes me an uncomfortable lesbian. I knew exactly two things about Oakland, that it was the home of the Black Panthers and that I was going, no matter how much my mother hated it. In Oakland, even the air felt different. Bart train stops smelled like unending piss, sweat, <laughs> and lost dreams. <laughs> I lived near 51st and Telegraph, and I started school at Mills College in the fall of 2006. I remember my first day of orientation. I smiled at everyone. I was eager for someone to know my name. <laughs> I was 22 and anxious to start the program that I thought would change my life. I had carried my grandmother's idea that women needed to have children, and if a woman didn't, someone should ask why. On a warm, sunny day in California, my Syracuse, New York grandmother landed on my tongue. The first thing I could muster up to my brand new, to my brand new advisor was, you never wanted to have any kids? The words <coughs> writhed on my mouth like maggots, disgusting and exciting. All my life, it felt like I had come from generations of women who have babies. And in that moment, I had landed in a universe where creation, invention, art, and ideas were the seeds of design and making of oneself. 
This was the beginning of seeing myself outside the picture my family had painted in my head. My advisor had been a woman too long for this question to bear any weight. She glanced at me quietly and answered with an ease I still don't have. No, she said, I don't want any. I wish I could say that was the first and last time I asked a woman why she didn't want to have kids, but it wasn't. <laughs> Reshaping ideologies takes time, you know. Even though I was raised kind of Baptist, I carry Catholic guilt. And somewhere in my head, not wanting to have kids might make me a bad person, a person unworthy of love, a woman no one could understand. I was pursuing my MFA in poetry, the degree that I thought would make me a real writer, even though my mother hated me living in a whole other city by myself. I missed her. I missed seeing her face. I miss waking up, climbing in her bed and rubbing her hair, hearing the sound of her laugh. I had met a teacher and poet named Almaz years earlier at a writing workshop for writers of color called Bona, and during my time at Mills, she was the closest thing to a goddess. Her hair was deliciously curly. She stood in deliberate and constant solidarity for all women of writers, women of color writers. Her mouth dripped with searing truths and bone-shattering poetry. She helped me get through my years and so many difficult years afterwards. When Almaz read her work out loud, it made me want to read and write and read and write more. She was warm as a hug, genuinely kind, and wanted everyone to have money for books, food on their tables, and enough confidence to fight for themselves. When I wasn't at school for eight to 12 hour days or working two jobs, I was finally home my living room filled with conversations about the fluidity of sexuality, heteronormativity, incense, homegirls with hard days and nights laid on my couch, and sage to keep things clean. My monogamous self had fallen for a polyamorous woman who swept me off my feet. She cleaned my house when I was overwhelmed, made sure I had at least $10 in my pocket, folded my laundry, washed my dishes, kissed me often, and regularly made sure I ate more than cereal, because left to my own devices, I will just eat cereal. <laughs> <laughs> my new homegirls were priestesses, organizers, activists, and other performers. I was shocked by their boldness in being able to discuss their identities, bodies, and background with a critical and empowering lens. I was just becoming comfortable with myself and all these ideas. For the first time in my life, being queer wasn't an issue, but a point of connection. These women became family, and like family, they made me think about what I was saying, what I meant to say, and why I was saying it. Suddenly, the best part of my growing identity was being adopted into the fierce femme family. If I needed bus fare for work, they gave it to me. If I was between a hard place and nothing to eat, we figured it out. They embraced me and called me pretty. I got to have femme brunches and lunch dates, we talked demonstrations, dresses, makeup palettes, patriarchy, performativity, fetishes, feminism, <laughs> pussy, pronouns. <laughs> and we hugged all the time. <laughs> it was clear to me in that space, this, this group of women, this space, this was my other family. The family that chose me that I had chosen right back. I found family all over the place. I didn't have to explain why or how I came to be gay. My people grew up like me, scared to say the words for fear of all that we'd lose. They had been gay bashed, outcasts, disrespected, ridiculed, just like me. It was as if these people could smell the gay on me and it was wonderful. <laughs> if my gay was a feeling, it would be the power of mermaids who aren't afraid to walk on dry land. Shimmery as turquoise glitter, warm as fresh glazed donuts, soothing as rain and earth on Sunday afternoon, buttery as mint chocolate chip ice cream, and carry the scent of a brand new purse. Just my brown body, my pigeon-toed strut and sparkling eyes became enough for the first time in a long time. I was enough. People smiled at me, laughed with me, became homegirls and sisters in the great struggle of self-love, of love, love, and freedom. 
Other femmes taught me about the discourse of survival and visibility. They taught me that I'm a star in drag, especially on days when I hate myself because I'm underemployed, a little lost, a little lonely, or fighting anxiety. My chosen family cheers for me, even when I forget to cheer for myself. They don't criticize my weight, my hair, or even tell me how to live my life. They celebrate me through triumph and growing pains. They remind me to look in the mirror and appreciate my reflection. Every time a chosen family member calls me, I feel home. When I moved to Oakland, I was searching for my identity, and I found community. I finished my MFA at the age of 24, and it didn't change my writing career, and it won't change yours either. Only you can do that. <laughs> I graduated in 2008, the same time the economy went uh, kerplunk, you know. And as hard as I tried, as hard as I tried, I could not find sustainable work. So I left Oakland with Nina Simone heartbreak. My poly relationship had crumbled into itself. And I could no longer afford my one bedroom apartment or the couch that kept homegirls from hard nights. Everything about me felt different and still somehow all the same. I live in San Diego now with not enough queer community, still writing and still connected to my chosen family. My mother and I are still struggling through our very complicated love. I find myself thinking about everything, the role of feminine identity, all sexual bodies, love and relationships, and right here, in San Diego, Oakland landed on my tongue. Last month, a coworker asked me what I was waiting for, why I didn't have any kids. And I responded, I'm not waiting for anything. I don't want any. And I didn't explain why or if that made me a good or a bad woman. Thank you. Woo!